My castaway this week is a traveller. In her early 30s, liberated from looking after her invalid mother in Ireland, she set off for India on a bicycle. It was a journey which took her six months to complete, cost her £64, and was recounted in a best-selling book called Full Tilt. Since then, she's written many other accounts of many other journeys to become one of our most celebrated travel writers. Now 61, she says she'll continue to travel as long as she's physically able. I still get a terrific charge from packing my bag and heading off, she says. She is Dervla Murphy. And, and packing your bag and heading off Dervla is something that you resolved to do, apparently, when you were really very, very young. Can you remember the moment when you thought, I know what my life is going to be about? Well, I suppose it wasn't quite knowing what my life would be about, but it was knowing very definitely that there was one thing I wanted to do in the course of my life, and that was cycle to India. And I was 10, and I'd just been given a um, second-hand bicycle for my 10th birthday and an atlas by my grandfather. And I had discovered, not being very good at geography yet, but I just discovered that you could actually, apart from, you know, getting across to Turkey, you could cycle all the way from Europe into India. And... Um, it was one day early in December, just about a week after I'd got these two gifts. I was cycling up a hill and I and, um, can remember looking down and thinking, well, if I went on doing this for long enough, I'd actually get to India. What, pushing the <laughs> just, pedals Just around. turning the pedals around, yes. Mm. Mm. And, and was, it, was it more than then just a childish ambition? Was it something that you completely, you fully intended to do? Oh, absolutely, yes. And I never spoke about it to anybody at that stage because, you know, I knew what the reaction would be, just a, another childish fantasy. And did you get into training right away? Did you start cycling long distances immediately? Not immediately, but I did. I mean, I cycled pretty well every day quite short distances until my first cycle tour when I was I think 17 that was just you know crossing to England cycling around Wales and southern England. So you were a serious cycler from the word. Oh yes. Mm. But you also did something else if you like in preparation for what you were to do didn't you? You you put yourself through in endurance tests you taught yourself to bear pain what did you do? Well, let's say putting your feet in very hot water, you know, and sort of training yourself not to feel pain, tying a string around your finger and pulling it tighter and tighter, and um, learning in a funny sort of way how to repel that kind of pain. So you which developed... Which actually you can do, yes. You developed a very high pain, yes. you, which has stood you in good stead, Indeed it has, it has to be said, as you've broken yes. ribs and ankles and, and yes. as you've gone about your business. You don't like being called brave, do you? No, because it isn't true. Well, I what? think fearless is true, but that's a totally different thing. I What's mean, the difference? Well, I mean, if you don't feel fear, you don't have to be brave. You're brave when you're overcoming fear. So you're not frightened of the idea of being plonked on a desert island? Oh, um, I would love it. Would you? Yes. Despite possible and hunger and poisonous snakes and all sorts of squalor well, and Well, I think I'd be very happy on the island. Mm -hmm. What about music? Is that important in this life for you? Very important, but I'm not knowledgeable about music. I mean, I'm not in any sense an expert, but it's always been very important as an escapist thing and an unwinding thing. Tell me about the first record, then, that you'll play on your desert island. Well, I would like Yehudi and Hepzibah Menuhin playing uh, the second movement of Beethoven's Sonata Number no. 10. I have this on 78s, and I associate it very much with, with my parents. With our listening together as a family... To music, even when things weren't easy with relationships within the family between myself and my parents, we could always listen together, and you know that had quite a healing effect because we had identical tastes in music, really. <laughs> Thank you. 
Yehudi and Hepzibah Menwin playing part of the second movement of Beethoven's Sonata No. 10 in G major, and that was recorded in 1938, one of the records that my castaway, Dervla Murphy, used to listen to with her parents. Your, your father apparently had a vast collection of 78s, Dervla. Quite a big collection, yes. I still have them, but now the machine on which I used to play them has folded up and I can't find a replacement. <laughs> And he it's was rather frustrating of them all sitting in the corner. He was the local librarian. Yes. Where was this? This was in uh, County Waterford, in southeast of Ireland. Which is where you still live. Oh yes, and wouldn't want to live permanently anywhere else. And you were an only child because your mother was an invalid. Yes. What was wrong with her? Uh, rheumatoid arthritis. I never saw her walking or standing. I mean, all my memories are of her in a bath chair. And um, I think I was only about six months old when, you know, she was became completely crippled at the age of 34, uh, 24. So obviously she never had any more children. No. And so you, you were doted on? And I was doted on, inevitably. And that was one reason, I think, why I enjoyed going off to boarding school after the first terrible week of homesickness. I suddenly felt liberated and, you know, I was just one of however many hundred it was. Nobody concentrating on whether my vest was aired or, you know, my shoes were leaking or whatever. So she, from her sedentary position, had a great deal of control over the, your early life, obviously. Oh, of she, course. She told you what to do. Mm. But she also encouraged you to go out and explore on this bicycle, Yes, she? I mean, she suggested when I was about 17 I take me off for my annual holidays on the bicycle, on my own, to the continent. But even when you were quite small, a lot younger than that, she encouraged you, didn't she, to... to be cycle, independent. And to cycle 25 miles oh, yes. to, down the coast. Yes. And, so Which, and when I was wondering, could I or couldn't I, she would say, well, of course you can if you want to. So she taught you mm. not to be frightened. Yes, yes. And to feel that if you really do want to do something, then you can do it. You're also a very imaginative child, by your own account. You mm. lay in bed muttering to yourself yes. at night, telling yourself stories. Yes. <laughs> and, and during the day. I mean, when I was very small, I used to spend hours standing in a corner with my back to the world, talking aloud to myself. And I had an aunt who was a child psychiatrist. And she became very worried about this and, you know told my parents that I needed a course of therapy to normalise me and so on. <laughs> and what sort of stories were you telling yourself? Oh, about a family of teddy bears that I'd invented. And they lived in a, in a big tree, which I'm happy to say is, I mean, a really gigantic tree, elm tree, which is still to the good. And it was divided into little villages and... You know, I mean, this went on for quite a few years. So you were a storyteller even then, and a writer at quite a, a young age as well. Didn't you win a local newspaper competition? Well, yes, but by then I was about 14. But I'd known for as long as I can remember that that's what I wanted to do. I never had any doubt about that. Should we have record number two? Well, record number two is... Reminds me very much of my father. It's Hummel's Variations and Shunaminka, which is based on Ukrainian folk dances. And it's, it's very frivolous. I think if I did get a bit depressed on the desert island, this would cheer me up at once. <laughs> One 
one of Hummel's variations on Schöner Minke for flute trio, played by Paula Hatcher, Charles Forbes and Glenn Jacobson. So you led Dervla Murphy a, a happy and relatively carefree childhood mm -hmm. with parents who loved you and taught you a love of music and of literature and, although quite poor, I think, yes. wanted to enrich you in Indeed. other ways. When did it all begin to go wrong? When did you begin to feel trapped by it all? I suppose when I was about 15 or 16, because I had to leave boarding school when I was 13, well, nearly 14, and come home to look after my mother because her condition was all the time gradually worsening. And this was during the war. And, you know, we couldn't get any servants, anybody to help to look after her. But I was actually delighted to leave school because I knew that I'd never pass an exam. I mean, I wasn't interested in passing exams. I knew what I wanted to do. And exams seemed completely irrelevant to that. So that seemed to be a great release for a few years. But then, of course, things got more and more difficult as my mother's health became worse. She became more and more demanding. Yes. And do you think that that was because she was becoming older and more incapacitated or, or did she change in personality, really, and cease to be this mother who wanted only you to be happy? And Not... No, that, that came rather later when um, her kidneys were affected... In retrospect, I think probably it was um, a question of the brain being affected by the malfunctioning kidneys. So that it seemed to me that she was suffering a personality change because I wasn't thinking then in detached scientific terms. I was just aware of the fact that the relationship between us was going very, very wrong. And she became totally dependent on yes. you? Yes. She even insisted you shared a bedroom, didn't she? Yes, and she needed her position to be shifted frequently to, to relieve the pain, which meant that for quite a number of years I never got an unbroken night's sleep, and that got me down quite badly, as I think it would any young person. But also, I mean, and this went on through your 20s. Oh, right it? through the 20s, yes, um, because uh, I was 30, I wasn't I, when she died. So that mm. you were frustrated, really, at every turn? Yes. Physically, For intellectually? Yes. Socially? L longing to travel. And, I mean, to travel seriously, way outside Europe. How desperate did you get? Oh, very desperate. Did, did and you... When my, when my father died 18 months before she died, I must have had a complete breakdown then because I actually can recall very, very little of that 18-month period. I went on the whiskey in a serious way, chain-smoked, ate very little, had broken night's sleep and, you know, was generally um, a wreck. Did you ever think of, of putting an end to it, either by putting an end to yourself or indeed to your mother? I thought of putting an end to her, but not to myself, really. But you would never have done that? I don't know. I mean, if it had gone on for another three, four, five years, I might well have done it. Mm. But in the end, she died? Yes. Was that an enormous release? Tremendous. Tinged with guilt? Not in the slightest. None? No. No remorse? No. Because as soon as she was gone, I seemed to be able to get things in perspective and to understand why she had been as she was, which I couldn't do while the conflict was still going on. Record number three. Record number three is um, part of the Andante from Haydn's string quartet in D minor, which is usually known as the fifths. And that reminds me of falling in love for the first time. I used to play it over and over again. It's quite a complicated piece of music, but very happy too.
Part of the Andante from Haydn's String Quartet in D minor, Opus 76, Number 2, played by the Janacek Quartet, and Memories of Your First Love, Dervler. You wrote um, about yourself at that point when your mother died. Mm. Uh, it's a, a heart-rending sentence. You wrote, as a daughter, I was a failure. As a woman, I was aging. Mm -hmm. As a writer, I was atrophied. And as a traveller, I had only glimpsed possibilities. Well, I suppose the odd thing about that book, I mean, my autobiography, is that I couldn't have written it deliberately for publication. It was written originally as a record of my early life for my daughter to read when she had grown up and also to help me to disentangle the relationship with my parents because it was difficult with my father too for other reasons. And eight years later, my publisher discovered the existence of the manuscript, which was literally a manuscript, it wasn't typed. And it was he who persuaded me then to, to publish it. But had I sat down deliberately to write my autobiography, it couldn't have turned out as it did, because I wouldn't have wanted to reveal so much of myself. You'd have been less honest. Mm. But now you've come to terms with it. Now, there, yes. Now you can talk about yes. it. So tell me, when you say you, you felt no guilt at your sense of release mm. when your mother died and you were 30, I mean, was there, in a funny kind of way, a sort of reassurance that you knew the worst about yourself? I think there probably was, yes. You sort of touched the bottom. Mm. And you, you stood there for, as you said, at the threshold of independent life. What sort of emotions did you feel then, then? I mean, exhilaration. Oh, of course, enormous exhilaration. But also, I mean, immediately I began to plan for the cycle to India so that, you know, the months following my mother's death were full of practical preparations, as it were. So, as you say, you set off for India to fulfil this childhood ambition. The problem was it was the coldest winter, 62, I 63. I know, and that was a very unfortunate <laughs> coincidence. How yes. cold was it? Describe it to me. Well, I can remember cycling into Rouen with an icicle a very long icicle hanging off the end of my nose. I mean, maybe that says enough about it. Did you, did you never think, this is ridiculous, it's just been one of those dreams that I'll never fulfil, I'm going back home? Oh, no. No, I, I mean, I did think it's pretty ridiculous to have set out now, but I suppose when... I mean, I had then been waiting 20 years to start this journey, and whatever the weather was like, I didn't feel like postponing it. So. You were going to go? Yes. Even if everybody thought you were mad? Mm. And they did. And they did, yes. Record number four. Well, record number four brings me back to part of that journey, my favourite country on that route, Afghanistan, and it's Babu Lala, a uh, push to wedding song from the region around Kandahar. And it's sung when the bride is leaving her own home and setting out for her husband's home, riding on a camel. And I first heard it in Afghanistan and heard it many times because it's a popular song, not reserved for this particular occasion. And what I like about this recording is the the coughing and the spitting in the background. You know, it, it really brings me back to sitting with them and listening to it. <coughs> Babulala, a Pushtu wedding song from the Kandahar region of Afghanistan. How did you get away, Dervler, in six months of travel across two continents, spending only 64 quid? Well, it just shows you what the cost of living was in those days. But what did you spend that on? I mean, this was early 60s, wasn't yes, it? Yes, 1963 I, I started out. And, um, well, I mean, one doesn't, in any case, on that sort of journey, spend very much. I mean, earlier this year I was 
in Africa for four months. And I spent less than £420 in, in four months travelling. Your material needs obviously are very few. Um, and you only need a medium-sized rucksack, apparently, to put it all in. That does mean, of course, that you don't change your clothes very often. It does, does it? indeed, yes. You <laughs> sleep in them happily and yes. wear them happily for mm. some time, weeks. Well, in, in Baltistan, actually, when uh, I was there with my daughter in the middle of winter, Neither of us took our clothes off, literally, for three months. Not once. I mean, the temperature went to minus 40 at night there, so, you know, at bedtime you didn't feel awfully like taking your clothes off. What's that like? I mean, do you, in the end, feel pretty wedded to them? Do you feel dirty? Do you feel you smell? You feel dirty and you smell for the first few days. Then after that, somehow you don't. The Tibetans say that all the natural oils form a sort of... Um, carapace, I suppose. <laughs> I mean, you're sealed, as it were. The fibres of the clothes join in, mm. so the whole thing is... Mm. What's it like when you finally take them off? Well, I regret to say, I mean, the thaw had just come, and um, when the thaw comes, of course, little things begin to breed. So we both had body lights and we took them off. But, I mean, we hadn't had them all during the three months. It was just the thaw that caused that. And that doesn't distress you or upset you? I mean, that's just part Well, I mean, it, it would if we'd been wearing them for another three months. <laughs> and uh, the bicycle, uh, well, certainly the bicycle you went out with in the first place to India is a, a very ordinary affair. No, yes. ge no gears? No gears. No, I, it had originally uh, three gears, but I had them removed because in those days they were quite fragile, easily upset and they would have been more trouble than they were worth. I mean, she, the roads then weren't as they are now. She had a name. You called her Ross, Ross this machine. Yes. Mm. It seems to me, reading about the journey, that you, you carried her as often as she carried you. Well, not quite. <laughs> but you did carry her across raging oh, yes. rivers and up mountains. Well, and well, yes, now and again. How mm. long were you together? Because you were obviously very fond of her. Tw well, 20 years. Mm. Where is she now? Is she in bits somewhere? In, in retirement in Dublin. Yes. But you've still got her. Oh, yes, of course. But in the end, of it, it's not your lack of luggage or any of these other tales that's impressive about your travels. It is your, I suppose, durability is, is the word one would think of for it. You know, I mean, on that very first trip to India, you were set on by wolves and by an amorous curd and you broke mm. three ribs in a fight on an Indian bus in the middle of nowhere. Recently you've broken your ankle and injured your back. Do you ever feel, you know, do you ever feel what the rest of us would feel? What on earth am I doing here? No. Never. I mean... Well, what do you think you're doing there? Enjoy myself. Quite simply. <laughs> record number five. Well, record number five would take me back to trekking through Ethiopia. And it's Ethiopian church music, which is the oldest known church music. It derives apparently from the 4th and 5th century Syrian church. And you can hear the, you know, the tinkle of the sistrum in the background. It's, it's wonderfully moving. <laughs> Ethiopian church music from volume one of Music of the Central Highlands of Ethiopia, recorded by Jean Jenkins. Has it happened very often, Dervla, that you found yourself somewhere in some remote part of the world and thought, this is it, I never want to go home again? No. No, I always want to go back to West Waterford. I mean, I'm very deeply rooted there. I, I think it must be something very primitive. I mean, that's my little bit of territory. It's nothing nationalistic or um, patriotic, you know. It's not going home to Ireland. It's going home to my patch of territory. And it's and, not materialistic. And it's a very, say. very beautiful part of Ireland, mm. West Wash. Well, one of the most beautiful parts of the world, I think. But then, of course, I'm biased. <laughs>
Well, I don't know, you've seen more than most. Um, you must also, in your travels, meet footloose young travellers in search of adventure who, mm -hmm. are, who are contemplating never going home again. Mm. What do you say to them? I mean, do you feel very sort of old and wise when you meet them? I, th I think, I mean, if, if they ever ask me for advice, which they obviously don't often do, but if they do, I, I suggest that they spend longer in one country and not try to cover the world in a year. And what about their general attitude as to why they're there? Do you think they're always there for the right reasons? Are there right reasons to be anywhere? Well, I should think their reasons are as right as mine are, you know. You don't think they're running away from something? Some are, obviously, but on the whole, I would say not. Do you think you're running away from... I mean, are you going to something or are you going from something? Now I'm certainly going, and I suppose over the last several journeys I've been going away from Western society. But also, of course, I'm going towards wherever I'm going to. Next piece of music. Record number six... Uh, Monteverde is the coronation of Papea, the final duet, which I think is an extraordinarily powerful piece of music, and you have to feel strong yourself emotionally to listen to it, in my view. <laughs> Richard Lewis and Magda Laszlo singing the duet Porti Miro Porti Godo from Monteverdi's L'Incoronazione di Popea with the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra conducted by John Pritchard. You took a few years off when you had your daughter, Rachel. Uh, she's 24 now. Um, and that was when you wrote your autobiography. But then, pretty quickly, actually, when she was four or five, you started taking her with you as well. Yes. That was, um, that was quite dangerous, wasn't it? I mean, you took her to India, you took her... Yes, she had her fifth birthday in India. We left a few weeks before it. But it was a journey tailored to her age in the sense that we travelled by local bus and then we spent two months living in a tiny village in the jungle. I mean, based there, you know. So you didn't have to worry for her safety so, or anything? No. So you had a daughter but, but no husband? Yes. Never, never a husband? No. Did you always rule that possibility out? Well, it was an odd thing. It was one of the things I knew when I was very young that I'd never marry, in the sense that I knew I would be a writer, though there was no talent showing at that stage to indicate that I might ever possibly, you know, achieve the writing ambition. But it was, it was knowledge on another sort of plane. I just knew it, and I also knew I wouldn't marry. Why? Why did you rule it out? Because these things aren't sort of just in you. They're things that you decide for yourself, really, aren't they? It's not... I'm not sure about that. No, I, I don't think so. I, I think um, it's part of one's destiny and you, you just recognise it. You were destined to be without a man. Mm. And it doesn't bother you one jot. Right. Mm. And in all the places that you visited, remote and near at home, just uh, allow me one, one of those hackneyed old questions. What's the worst meal that you've ever been required to eat? Oh, there's absolutely no doubt about that. In Cameroon... I can't remember now what they call it, but it's made from the guts of fish. It's a sort of yellow, grey, brown colour, and it is repulsive beyond any possibility of describing it. And it's served with a, a, a sort of mess of half cooked maize dumpling around it, you know, and. and ugh. Worse even than stewed intestine of rat, which I know you've sampled. Oh, worse than anything. I mean, in a league of its own, you know, <laughs> absolutely. 
<laughs> but you've eaten all of these things and not been sick. I had very bad dysentery on the first trip. And in a way, I think that immunised me to dysentery. But, I mean, it was seriously bad. And I've never had that since. But I have. I mean, I've picked up hepatitis in Madagascar. And this year, malaria for the first time in, in Zimbabwe. You know, I mean, one does pick things up along the way. Nothing that a bit of determination and a good swig of rum can't do can't away say. with. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Record number seven. Oh, well, yes, this is in case, you know, it's not likely, but I might get lonely on the island. So this is a dance tune uh, to summon a spirit, and it's played in southwest Madagascar, and then I could have the spirit to keep me company. <laughs> tune for a possession seance from southwest Madagascar played on the wooden zither. Somebody wrote not long ago that interviewing Dervla Murphy was like trying to open an oyster with a damp bus ticket. <laughs> Do you hate being interviewed? No, absolutely. Detest it. That's when I'm afraid. So now is when you're being truly brave. Yes, exactly. <laughs> but why do you think that is, when you write so fluently and when you have so much to say? I know what my my medium it is, and, you know, it's sitting there just writing, not having to talk. Um, you're 61, which means that you've had, by your account anyway, 31 years of mm. independence. Mm. You obviously came to terms some time ago with uh, the difficulties of the first 30 years. Do you feel that you've achieved your that freedom and that fulfilment with, as it were, your mother's blessing? Would she have oh, approved yes. of you? I think very much so, yes. I have no doubt about that. And your father? Very much so. I mean, I, I think they would have... Um, well, I know they would have been very pleased that, you know, I had some modest success as a writer because my father himself always wanted to write. Of course, obviously, my mother, because, I mean, she was my mentor when I was first trying to write as quite a small child she would criticise everything I wrote I mean in, in the constructive sense and point out what was wrong and how this could be improved and she was somebody incapable of reading a book without analysing it and criticising it and taking it to bits to find out why it was so good or not good as the case might be so I mean that was a, another fortunate thing to have a mother like that who could give you so much of the sort of guidance you were looking for. Last record. Well, the last record is my, absolutely my favourite piece of music in the world, Beethoven's Triple Concerto. And if I'm conscious when I'm dying, I'd like that to be played because I'd like that to be my last experience of being, listening to that.
part of Beethoven's Triple Concerto in C major for piano, violin, cello and orchestra, played by Eugene Istomin, Isaac Stern and Leonard Rose, with the Philadelphia Orchestra, conducted by Eugene Ormandy. And I take it that's the important record of oh, eight yes. that you've chosen. Yes. Not a doubt there. Mm-hmm. What about your book, Dava? I think Pepys's diary. I mean, we can have it bound in one. Mm. You know, the ten volumes bound, in, so there's just one book. And, I mean, that's a whole world, so that when I got a little bit bored of the island, that would be a completely separate world to move into. And what about your luxury? No, well, there's no doubt about that. I must have a still, because there'll be lots of lovely fruits and berries and whatnot, and roots, perhaps, on the island, so then I can have something warming in the evening when I've distilled it. Dervla Murphy, thank you very much indeed for letting us hear your Desert Island Discs. Thank you. <laughs>